All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to today's webinar, Service Mess to Service Mesh. I'm Taylor Wagner, the Operations Analyst here at CNCF, and I will be hosting slash moderating today. Um, we'd like to welcome our presenters, Kavya Perlman, the Cybersecurity Strategist at Wallarm, and Rob Richardson, Technical Evangelist at MemSQL. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee, but there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, so please feel free to drop your questions in there rather than the normal chat window, and we'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A at the end. Um, a reminder that this is an official webinar of the CNCF, and as such, is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please don't add anything to the chat or to the Q&A that would be in violation of that code. Um, basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and the presenters. And a reminder that the recording and slides will be posted later today on the CNCF webinar page, which is cncf.io slash webinars. Um, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Kavya and Rob to kick off today's presentation. Thank you, Taylor. What if there were no traffic rules and barely any traffic lights? Just one traffic cop, basically for the namesake, and every car just, a car or automobiles just in the town had some place to go, just no set of standard rules on how to get there. So what ends up happening is these cars, people, police, traffic signals create a messy situation. In fact, imagine traffic cop is giving people tickets and telling people where they should go. However, none of this is really helping the situation. Now think about another scenario, something more futuristic, where there is not just a set of rules, but a real time continuous intelligence sharing, full visibility, full connectivity, kind of like the fully autonomous vehicles. Contrary to handing out tickets now, we can now route our traffic uh, and communicate intelligently and efficiently so that we could maximize on all the knowledge each vehicle and the cop has. This is the analogy we would like to use today. And we would like you to keep in mind this analogy as we go through the webinar together. Presenting with me today is Rob Richardson, my very good friend. Rob began as a software developer in 2000, the times when uh, we needed to deploy our website. So he got good at server administration for Windows and Linux. As our community got better at source control, Rob learned um, and taught CVS, C SVN, and Git. And in the time community got better at unit testing, software, so he learned unit testing and dependency injection. We moved towards continuous integration principle. So Rob learned cruise control, team city, and eventually Azure DevOps, uh, leading workshops and courses for individuals and companies learning system automation. Now we are in a containerized world. So Rob has been learning and teaching Docker and Kubernetes since 2016. Rob is first and foremost a developer and a teacher. So he's grown with us through the software mess. Now, Rob is a tech evangelist for MemSQL where he gets to share his passion for software development and application architecture with the world as an international conference speaker. But even still, Rob can be seen tinkering with the code and teaching a few, teaching the few at events like AZ Give Camp and Southeast Valley.net user group. This is funny. Uh, one of the things uh, that he is most proud of is, uh, and because uh, I've done this <laughs> intro a few times for Rob, it's always funny when I read this. Um, he's, always, he's most proud of um, the comment that he posted at .NET Rocks podcast. They gave, uh, they read it on the air and sent him a mug. Woohoo for Rob. <laughs> I met Rob Richardson as he was uh, teaching at security, teaching security at Phoenix at a DevSecOps conference. He was doing a Kubernetes security talk and I could totally see his passion for teaching various technologies, including cloud native security. That's what brought him uh, to MemSQL, where MemSQL recently launched their cloud-native managed database, MemSQL Helios. Rob and I 
have written blogs together, given a few talks together, including CNC of FinTech Forum at Wall Street, New, York's, New York City, uh, talking about Kubernetes security. So Rob, thank you again <laughs> so much for this collaboration. I am really excited now, and uh, I'm glad that we continue this journey together for teaching and learning. And as always, I look forward to learning with you today. Most definitely. Thanks for the kind words, Kavya. I'm really excited to join with you, my good friend. Kavya is a cybersecurity strategist at Wallarm, an application security company that protects APIs and cloud native technologies. Just last year at KubeCon, Kavya was part of a big launch where Wallarm extended their capabilities to support service mesh architecture and Envoy proxy. Here's my favorite part as we dig into the history and story of Kavya. She's amazing. Kavya was a third party security advisor for Facebook during the last U US presidential election. So she was able to review technologies of various sizes and innovative things like cloud native and virtual and augmented reality and see it, how it could impact a platform as big as Facebook with 2 billion users. Due to her work and contribution to the security industry, she has won several awards. She is also known as the Cyber Guardian. She's the founder and CEO of the XR Safety Initiative a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping build safe and immersive environments via virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality. I'm really excited to see the skills and talents of Kavya and really thrilled that I get to share the stage with you, my good friend. Oh, thank you, Rob. So let's dig in to what we're going to talk about today. We're witnessing the rise of microservices and cloud native technologies. However, one big challenge of microservice architecture is the overhead of managing network communication between services. Many companies are successfully using tools like Kubernetes for deployment, but they still face runtime challenges with routing, monitoring, and security. Having a mess of tens, hundreds, or even thousands of services communicating in a, pro in a production is a job only for the brave technical hearts. This is where service mesh comes to clean up the mess. In the next, 40 minutes, we'll discuss the service mesh. We'll discuss our history of getting from monolithic to microservices. We'll discuss the challenge that we had with API gateways and the market that it created for a service mesh. We'll dive deep into the principles and uh, practices of service mesh, looking at both Istio and Linkerd as examples. We'll do a demo of both Linkerd and Istio. And then we'll summarize with service mesh best practices and cases where you may choose to use it or may choose not to use it. So, what is Service Mesh? Rob and I have spent a great deal of time reviewing various definitions of Service Mesh, and we arrived at one of the simplest one being our favorite. A Service Mesh manages the network traffic between services in a graceful and scalable way. Service Mesh is the answer to, how do I observe, control, and secure communication between microservices. A service mesh answers the question, how do I observe, control, secure communication between services? So let's look deeper. A service mesh inter intercepts traffic going into and out of a container, whether between containers or, or from to outside of the resources. Because it intercepts all cluster network traffic, it can monitor and validate connections, mapping out the communication between services. It can also understand service health, intercept failures, or inject chaos. The beauty of intercepting all cluster traffic is that service mesh can do really interesting things to validate and route traffic. In general, we choose a service mesh when we are looking to solve one of these problems. Observe. Observe traffic in the cluster, discover, map, or log. Control, control traffic in the cluster, access policies, split traffic between versions. And finally, secure, secure traffic between network resources, such as HTTPS between containers. Now, let's take a look at the difference between monolithic and microservice architectures. A uh, monolithic architecture is a traditional model for designing and developing software. The monolithic applications consist of a single contained, uh, single self-contained unit in which all the code exists in a single code base and in which modules are interconnected. Uh, 
At the deployment time, the entire code base is deployed and scaling is achieved by adding additional nodes. However, though, much like the evolution of automobiles, the more complex the system became, but the more challenging it was to maintain self-contained solutions. The problem was that as the code base and the applications grew in terms of functionality and complexity, the more challenging it became to iterate on it. Each component of Monolith had to be tuned to work perfectly with the other components or else the entire system applications would fail. And prior to actually uh, doing the Facebook third party, uh, right after doing the Facebook third party security uh, work, I joined as a head of security for a virtual reality firm uh, and the oldest virtual world, Second Life, uh, at Linden Lab. And so as a head of security with all those legacy systems, I really got to witness this entire sort of messy situation and moving on to microservices. And this is where microservices are really great. A microservice architecture involves the building of modules that address a specific task or business objective. Microservices are created in order to overcome the issues and constraints of monolithic applications. Monolithic applications have a tendency to grow over time and in size. So as the applications become larger and larger, this sort of tight coupling between components result in slower and more challenging deployments. Microservices solve these challenges of monolithic system and because they're much more, you know, being as modular as possible. So in the simplest form, they help build an application as a suite of small services, each running its own process and are independently deployable. These services may be written in different programming languages and may use different data storage techniques. In our monolithic old architecture, we dealt mostly exclusively with north-south traffic. But with microservices, we must increasingly deal with traffic inside the cluster. With monolith monoliths, different components communicated with each other using function calls within the application. Edge gateways abstracted away common traffic orchestration function at the edge, such as authentication, logging, rate limiting. But communication conducted within the confines of the monolith did not require any of those activities. While east-west traffic presents a greater challenge due to replacing our function calls with communication over the network, it allows us to use whatever transport method we want as we replaced function and invocation with APIs over network. This means that the different services within our architecture don't have to know about each other. If our API is consumable, then we have the flexibility with everything else. This can provide a big advantage. For instance, if we are a big organization and if we acquire another team, we don't have to worry about the coding language they're using or how they do things. So with the increased east-west traffic that comes with microservices, we now need the ability to properly orchestrate it, which is the same issue we face with our monolith at the edge. Uh, we needed to effectively route the traffic. And that's where we first learned on the, about the API gateways, which Rob is going to tell us more about. Uh, over to you, Rob. Most definitely. I love this analogy of Northwest and uh, North, South, and East, West. And thank you for teaching that to us. North, South is into containers, and East, West is between containers. And that's really where we start to hit this wall with API gateways. An API gateway is great at standing in front of our cluster and being that initial uh, gate, that initial barrier. Assuming that our user interface is in the browser, a, a thick client spa, the user interface will connect to the API gateway and the API gateway will fan out that traffic to each microservice. But what we see down here at the bottom is that some of our microservices have misbehaved. They're not doing that thing about a uh, microservice should own its own data source. So they're going directly to other microservices data sources. And an API gateway being that boundary around our cluster really can't help us here. It can only really say, well, you know, the traffic was valid coming in. <laughs> and so when we reach the limit of API gateways, that's when we started to dig into um, service meshes. We want a way to be able to control the traffic not only into our cluster and out of our cluster, that north-south content, but also between our microservices, east-west. 
as we go through our cluster. So here's an example of a service mesh. In our service mesh uh, scenario, service A wants to connect to service B. Now, instead of service A connecting directly to service B as it would without a service mesh, service A is going to reach out into that sidecar proxy that's, de that's defined in that same pod. So as service A got deployed, the sidecar proxy got included in there. So service A reaches out to the, si the sidecar proxy, and the sidecar proxy reaches out to the service mesh's control plane. Is service A allowed to connect to service B? What's the URL for service B? Those details come back to the service A's sidecar proxy, and the proxy then connects to service B's sidecar proxy. And we can do mutual TLS if we choose to do so. So service B's sidecar proxy then reaches out to the control plane as well and says, hey, is service A allowed to connect to me? The control plane confirms that, and service B's proxy forwards that traffic on the service B. The cool part is that service A and service B are now able to communicate, but all of the details about am I authorized to connect to that other service, all of the details about mutual TLS, all of those are handled by the sidecar proxies and the service mesh control plane. We can do similar analogies if service A wanted to talk to an external service, or if ingress traffic was flowing into service B. All of that detail is managed by the service mesh control plane, and all of those sidecar proxies deployed with each service allow us to get those insights, allow us to collect uh, telemetry and logging, and really get a feel for how the traffic moves through our cluster. So we talked about observe, control, and secure. As we start to dig into the features of service mesh, we get a really good feel for observe, control, and secure. On the observe side, because we have these sidecar proxies, uh, proxying all the traffic in our cluster, we can start to monitor that network traffic. We can see failures. We can log failures. We can log uptime. Towards control, we have access policies. Is service A allowed to connect to service B? We can create additional policies like only things within my namespace or only things with this RBAC token are allowed to connect to this cluster or this container. Towards secure, we now have mutual TLS. And it's mutual TLS that didn't require code changes in our applications to ensure the, the content. We don't need to worry about trust chains. We don't need to worry about uh, certificate revocation. All of that is handled by the service mesh. Digging a bit deeper, now that we're proxying traffic between all services, we can create some of these uh, higher level services. We can do things like monitoring service health and logging when systems are uh, up and down. We can dig into more complex logging, gra grabbing all of the response codes and validating uh, service health, uh, detailing uh, traffic between services, and keeping track of uh, how a request flows across the, the system. Because we're proxy proxying all traffic between all containers, one of the really cool things is we can ask the service mesh for a ne network topology diagram a network architecture diagram. Now the beauty here, it's not what the developer thought would happen, but it's what's actually happening in the cluster based on actual traffic patterns. Digging further into the features, because we're routing all of the traffic, we can do some really intelligent things with that traffic. So for example, if a service is failing, we can flip the circuit breaker and suddenly no traffic is flowing to that surface service while that service heals. So when the service comes back online, the service mesh can notice and start routing traffic to it. In the meantime, it's just going to intelligently fail all of the requests to that service so that uh, additional, so the clients aren't waiting for that content. Similarly, we can do A-B testing, where a portion of the traffic goes to the new channel, the new version, while we uh, validate that that behaves as expected. Once that system is contained and healthy, we can start to route more traffic, eventually strangling the content from the old version. Similarly, we could create a beta channel or a canary release where we can say, here's that newest feature for those people who are able to see it. So we can grab details like HTTP headers or authentication tokens and route content to the new versions while keeping the majority of the content at the original versions. All these are possible with these advanced routing rules because we're proxying all traffic across all services. Digging deeper, we now have dashboards over the top of our uh, service mesh where we can take a look at, on the left, 
the service health and uh, history of each service. On the right, there's that network topology diagram where we can ask the services exactly what they're doing and route actual traffic and show actual traffic routing across our, our, his, uh, our service mesh. So because we have these uh, proxies validating all of the rules, we won't end up in this scenario where a microservice accidentally calls into a different microservices data store. We can create those rules to ensure that each microservice owns its own data store and only those authorized to connect to each container are allowed to do so. So we're gonna look at two examples of service meshes today. We're gonna to look at both Linkerd and Istio. And so before we do that, let's look at kind of a high level what Linkerd is about. Now we could do a bake off comparing speed or features, but that's gonna be transient and that's gonna evolve over time. Instead, let's look at kind of the methodology. The methodology of Linkerd is that they focus on a simple setup. They're really proud of their install procedure. And just a core piece of functionality that allows you to get going. If you need advanced scenarios, then they invite you to grab third party components and strap those on. All of those core pieces, they build in house. And so they're really great at, com at contributing to the Go and Rust communities as they build out the features necessary to create these, this content. Similarly with Istio, Istio's methodology is to create a suite of features that you can toggle on and off. So by installing their software, you have all of the pieces that you need to go. Istio is also really good at combining the best from the, the industry. So they include a whole lot of third party products. Linkerd in version two uses an Envoy proxy as well. Istio uses an Envoy proxy, metrics from Grafana, a Prometheus dashboard, a Jaeger tracing dashboard, and we'll see other dashboards as well. We can see on the right, because we have this uh, methodology of proxying all traffic, on the right is this virtual service that allows 75% of the traffic to version one and 25% of the traffic to version two for this service. That's possible in Istio, given these advanced routing rules. So let's dig into a demo. We're gonna take a look at Istio and Linkerd. So I don't have Linkerd running yet. I just have an empty cluster. But let's start out doing exactly that. Let's go to the Linkerd startup page. I am going to have to break out of the slides. The Istio, the Linkerd getting started page is really elegant and walks us through all of the processes for getting that installed. I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to do this. Um, Linkerd check, and it can go validate that my uh, cluster meets the necessary recommendations for Linkerd. Once I've got that in place, let's go download Linkerd. So I did install the Linkerd command line. I did put that in my path. And so I can just do that Linkerd install. Linkerd check is great. Linkerd check will now go see how did it do? It's going to watch those pods and uh, validate that they start up correctly and keep track of all of the details in, in Linkerd to make sure that everything is running correctly. I love that it enumerates all of the pieces of my cluster and validates that it's working correctly. So this just takes a minute to get going. Uh, I'll scroll up. Nope, I won't scroll up. That Linkerd install. I just pipe that off to kubectl apply, and uh, ultimately that gets that content into place. So great, now my Linkerd uh, install is ready to go. Let's go take a look at it. Linkerd dashboard. So Linkerd dashboard will start this dashboard and I'll be able to see all of the pieces of my cluster. I'm gonna switch over to the Linkerd namespace and I can see all of the uh, containers, I can see the various details with each one. If I switch over to deployments or uh, other uh, content here, I can then flip over to the Grafana dashboard where I can see the actual metrics for this service doing all the things that it needs to do. 
Now this is really great. I get to see the service health. I get to see Grafana dashboards. I get to see all of the content involved in my Linkerd dashboard. So I'm going to break out of that and let's switch over to Istio. Oh, one more thing. Um, that dashboard was really good for harvesting all the statistics, but in time, I may want to flip over to doing that from a command line interface where I can harvest this and push that content elsewhere. I do have a Prometheus dashboard where I can uh, grab that content using Prometheus, a Prometheus sync rather, uh, but I can also grab these metrics from the command line where I could use that to pipe it to other content as well. So switching over to um, Istio, let's flip over to the Istio cluster where Linkerd focused on that really fast setup experience, Istio focuses on having uh, pieces that allow us to turn things on and off. So for example, um, here's the profiles that allow us to turn on and off various features. So if I want, uh, if I want to default to all things on, which I do in this case, I have the demo profile running, then I have all of these features enabled. And so if I don't find a profile that exactly matches what I'm looking for, I can definitely turn on and off features as I go. Grafana, Istio Tracing, Kiali, Prometheus, all these dashboards we can enable or disable by just triggering, uh, turning them on and off inside Istio. So the Istio docs are really great at getting us started. Uh, I already have the Istio uh, set up installed, and I have this demo app. Now this demo app is really cool at kind of highlighting those advanced routing rules. Each of these boxes are a spot where it has a proxy involved. So I have an ingress proxy that will hand me off to the product page. The product page will call into a detail service to get the product details, and it'll also call into a review service. Now the review service goes and gets the ratings from this node app, and then it'll show different stars or not stars, depending on the version. In version one, it shows no stars. In version two, it'll show black stars. And in version three, it'll show red stars. So I've got that application up right here. I can push refresh. And I see that now I have no stars. Those stars are gone in version one. Well, the interesting thing here in Istio is that I've got this uh, virtual service that routes all traffic to version one. Now I could choose instead to perhaps route traffic. Let's start up version two. And I want to start by just putting 20% of the traffic towards version two. The other 80% will stay to version one. So I'm going to go grab that. Um, grab that. YAML and set that in place, kubectl apply that uh, YAML file, and now I've got that traffic ready to go. Flipping back over to the browser, 20% of the time, I will get black stars, and 80% of the time, I'll get no stars. And it looks like I'm hitting the 80% of the time that whole time. That's really cool. So let's flip over to uh, version two. We've got everything ready to go. And um, oh, I see I applied the wrong YAML. Let's go back and apply that 80-20 rule. So that 80-20 rule, now I'll see 20% of the time I've got those black stars. So that looks good. I've got version 2 ready to go. Let's set version 2 completely in place. Now I'll always get version 2. I'll always get those black stars. Well, in time, let's start looking at version three. I want to do, I don't know, 50-50 traffic between two and three. So let's go grab that uh, YAML file and set that in place. And now I can see that about half the time I'll get the red stars and about half the time I'll get the black stars. When I'm comfortable, I can flip over completely to version three. And now I'll only see the red stars. In a similar way to upgrading between uh, the various things, we could also upgrade across, uh, upgrade based on other conditions. Like in this case, the end user has to be JSON. 
And if Jason is logged in, then he'll get the version two system. Otherwise, everyone will get the version three system. So we can do those advanced routing rules. Because we're proxying all the traffic between all the things, we can do really interesting things to say, for example, some of the traffic goes here and some of the traffic goes there. I would love to be able to dig into all kinds of interesting features with Istio and Linkerd, but sadly, <laughs> that's as far as we can go on those demos. That was really, really cool. Awesome, Rob. I love that demo. And uh, every time I've seen it, I've learned more and more stuff from you. And one thing for sure, thank you, demo gods. You did not get upset with us. <laughs> <It's always laughs> yes. This uh, really, really was cool. So yeah, thank you for that demo. And uh, let's see. Um, I want to do a quick recap of everything that Rob sort of talked about. And uh, so a service mesh proxies all the traffic through the cluster. We now know that. Uh, at its very most basic level, because it stands between all the traffic, it can monitor, tr uh, monitor traffic, learn from it, and infer service health and log failures. As you saw, now if that's just the crawl, now let's take a look at the next layer which is the walk. As we saw in the demo, the walk scenario, advanced routing scenario, because it proxies all the traffic, we can add additional services, service abstraction, such as routing traffic between two versions or the, of the service or stopping traffic with a circuit breaker. On to the next layer, which is run, because the service mesh proxies through all the traffic, we can get actual service topology who calls what basically. And as Rob just demoed, this isn't just, this isn't the developer's hope of what will happen. This is the actual traffic through the cluster. A service mesh is able to do all the things because it observes, controls, and secures all the traffic, both north-south and east-west traffic. So there we have it, a traffic proxy plus a control plane. Uh, that's literally what is service mesh. In fact, in the wise words of our good friend, Zach Butcher, who is the author of Istio Up and Running Using Service Mesh, if it doesn't have a control plane, it ain't a service mesh. With that said, service mesh is not the preferred solution for all scenarios. And for that, I'm gonna hand this back over to Rob who will help us dive into some of those complexities? Most definitely, thanks you. Thanks, Kavya. I agree, service mesh is a great thing that allows us to observe, control, and secure the traffic. And with that, there's some downsides. There's some costs associated with that. On the left, we have our Kubernetes cluster. We have the control plane with the API server, the controller manager, the scheduler. We have the nodes that have the kubelet, the C advisor, the cube proxy. And then we have the work that we need to do, the pods that contain our containers. On the right, we have all of the details of our service, our service mesh. Each of those services have another proxy and we have the entire control plane for the service mesh. What we see is that we pretty much have double the container count in our cluster. We have the control plane for Kubernetes and we have the control plane for our service mesh. We have all of our services doing the work and we have all of the proxies that allow uh, traffic between things. If we're gonna run a service mesh, we need to be comfortable that we're probably gonna double the number of, the number of containers in our cluster. And we'll probably significantly increase the computation in our cluster as well. We'll probably not hit double, but we're doing, because the proxies are a lot lighter weight than the Java Tomcat services that we have running in our cluster. But we're also doing TLS that we weren't doing before, mutual TLS between each service. So it's not unexpected for us to think of maybe doubling our container count and maybe doubling or maybe 1.6 times the amount of compute in our cluster. This is a non-trivial cost. This, in, this creates additional spend in building out our cluster. We need a cluster that is uh, roughly twice as big to be able to handle a, 
Kubernetes cluster and a service mesh. That's not unexpected. If we're after the benefits of securing, controlling, and observing our traffic, this is perfect. But if we're just reaching for a service mesh because we have a Kubernetes cluster and we just want to throw a service mesh in just to see what, what happens, we may be disappointed. Service mesh isn't the perfect solution for everything. If we're comfortable with that additional compute cost and we really need those features, then service mesh can be our perfect solution. And with that, I want to talk about some of the benefits of service mesh. One of the key benefits that we are able to observe all the traffic move through the cluster, creating transparency. Naturally, we get to get more get to a more comfortable place where we can troubleshoot when all the request response is happening transparently because then it's easy to track down calls which are failing and fixing replacing the service within a new instance. On top of that, using service mesh, debugging hundreds of microservices becomes easy and fast. Service mesh helps us gain control on the network through features like circuit breakers, splitting traffic through A-B tests. This essentially enables resiliency and enhances network rob robustness. Uh, when it comes to the secure part, we can get mutual TLS between containers without having to break cert certificates into our containers or tell the containers to flip to HTTPS or validate trust chains, etc. Basically, any of the heavy lifting uh, associated with certificates, we can now do all of that inside the service mesh meshes. There can be downside to reaching out to service mesh too quickly. Robin, I actually wrote a CNCF blog post about this whole topic. Um, and Rob, as Rob just explained, I just wanna reiterate this in our conclusion that we both came to. Uh, we must remain cognizant of the cost of additional resource requirements for a service mesh. You need a service mesh if you have any of these business needs. If you're running highly sensitive services like PKI, PCI, etc. If you're running untrusted workloads, if you need security in depth, if you need AB routing or beta channel, if you're running multi-tenant workloads, Reach for a service mesh for observing, controlling, or securing traffic in a Kubernetes cluster. Because the service mesh intercepts traffic into and out of each container, it's a great way to monitor and control traffic, whether you're looking to secure this traffic with mutual TLS or authorize inter-service communication or monitor traffic between services. A service mesh can be a great choice to clean up the mess. And with that, I do want to hand over uh, our contact details, you guys. I am Kavya Perlman um, on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can also Google me. Uh, you, can, you can also reach out, reach out to me via volarm.com uh, using requests at volarm.com. And then there's my good friend, Rob Rich, who is available via Twitter at Rob-Rich and uh, has this wonderful website where he puts out all of the slides that he uses and many, many other informational stuff, robrich.org. And so now we would love to take some questions that I'm looking at are coming in. Um, Rob, you ready for some questions? I am. This is so much fun digging in with you, my good friend. I love it. It's uh, it's been it's been so wonderful, and we actually have a stack of questions. So let's begin. Oh, very nice. Let's dig in. Yep. Uh, so the first question, and uh, there was a question. It was funny uh, when you were talking about uh, API gateways. Somebody actually had a question about API gateways, and you literally like literally at the same time were answering that. And I hope that. Oh, that's answered. perfect. <laughs> um, so we are all kind of thinking alike. Uh, so the first question right. is, does service mesh have a built-in queues for queuing requests when a given service fails so that the request can be retried when the, when the failed service heals? Most definitely. You can enable uh, retries within your services inside the service mesh, 
there is some benefits and drawbacks to that because I could automatically retry, but is the calling service going to time out waiting for me to finish retrying? And so it's definitely possible, but it's one of those features that you want to consider carefully. Maybe I can retry once or twice, but retrying for five minutes or a logarithmic back off that may last uh, a really long time may not be a great use case. Yeah. Um, the service mesh definitely can do it, but uh, you may want to steer away from that. Yeah, I remember you talked about it as we were discussing our webinar is like, you know, it may actually compound the problem if you retry too soon. Right. All right, on to the next question. How service mesh helps us in a situation where we make a lot of calls uh, to external APIs, which we don't control, we can control traffic to those APIs too, question mark, like having a circuit breaker for external APIs. And I think you yes, sort of definitely. talked about it, yeah. In the same way that you have a, a proxy between services, we'll have an egress proxy and an ingress proxy. And so as you're calling that external API, you'll go through the proxy and the proxy can do things like automatic retries, circuit breakers, and all of the features that we expect from a service mesh. But now we're using that to contact external services. Maybe they're on virtual machines, maybe they're even outside your cluster. Yeah. And then is there a way to control traffic across multiple K8 clusters? Yes. There is definitely a way to control this, uh, and that's where service mesh comes in handy. Is that Rob? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Controlling across clusters gets a little bit weird because it's like, well, which cluster gets to own this? But by all means, uh, service mesh can definitely help you there. And we have the next question. Hi, is there any change required on the application pods in order to support canary upgrades? That is a good question. I like that. Is there any change involved in the pods themselves to support canary upgrades? Let's think through that a little bit because yeah. that will really help drive home some of the principles of service mesh. Yeah. We create, for example, these routing rules that tell us there's some traffic going to one service and going to another service. And here's the rule that says what makes the traffic go between them. Do we see any changes in our code to make this happen? Uh, What's really cool is all of this lives completely in the service mesh. It doesn't need to be in our code at all. We just happen to run version two and version three of our service. We run those two sets of containers and the service mesh takes care of everything else. Hmm. Wonderful. And I am gonna, breeze through just a couple of questions to, let's say, um, I do encourage people and everybody to reach out to us directly to answer these, to, you know, to get some of the answers. We're very uh, active on Twitter. Uh, so please uh, feel free to anytime tag at us and ask these type of questions. But I do want to take another question, um, which is, how does a service mesh relate to an ingress controller like Nginx? Can they coexist or do you have to use only one exclusively? That is a great question. Let's go back to this Istio diagram and I'm gonna use Istio as an example, but the same occurs for others. Um, here in this bookstore app, we have this ingress proxy. And so this could be an Nginx ingress proxy. In this case, it's an Envoy proxy. And so our content comes into that proxy. And at that point, it's now controlled into our service mesh. Was there an Nginx, proxy, uh, Nginx ingress controller ahead of that? Eh, maybe, probably not. Probably it hits that ingress Envoy proxy straight away. It's possible to do both. You know, If you really, really want SSL termination in your Nginx ingress proxy, or you want really uh, interesting rules there, you may choose to put the uh, Nginx ingress proxy behind the um, service mesh ingress proxy. But eh, I've generally found that the service mesh proxy, the service mesh ingress is sufficient for the majority of my needs. Cool. And then there is another question here, is are Linkerd and Istio commercial or self-help uh, 
commercial off the shelf or open source. And it is my understanding it is open source, but there are commercial, uh, commercially related uh, tools available. Uh, one of the ones that, um, and it, for protection or for other secure control, other security services, there are tools available. One of the ones that I was part of, which was the wall arm launch I earlier talked about, um, you know, following many, many requests from the customer, wall arm extended its apps and API security to work with some of the distributed application using uh, Envoy proxy. So it could not just protect North South API in the applications that use uh, Envoy as an alternative ingress controllers at the front end of the Kubernetes cluster. So it can also now protect the edge traffic, East-West Envoy API for service mesh in Istio. So definitely, uh, right, Rob, it's open source, uh, ACU and Linkerd, but there are other, you know, commercially available stuff as well. Right, exactly. Both Istio and Linkerd are free and open source. And uh, there are other service meshes that you could consider or other security products that you could choose to layer on top if you wanted to. And I think with that, I just want to take one last question, which already we went over, but it would be a nice recap and end the, the, the session today. What are the strengths and weaknesses of Linkerd and Istio? And this is so funny because we've always talked about it. We are going to dig even deeper into those two, Linkerd and Istio. People come up, came up to me during KubeCon as well, asking like, hey, which one is which? And, you know, we're still like on this journey. Rob and I are on this journey to really find out like, in the very micro granular detail, what is really going on. But thus far, Rob, what, what do you think we have established in, in what context, which one should be used? I think it's one of those questions like iPhone and Android where there isn't a right answer, but there's a right answer for you. Yeah. And so as we looked at it, we kind of looked at the methodology. Istio, everything is in the box. And so if you don't want to have to pick features, you just want to turn them on and off, Istio can be a great choice. It also includes uh, the best of open source packages for monitoring and traffic routing and all of the pieces that we want to add are in the box. By extension, Linkerd focuses on very simple implementation, very simple installation. And so you can get up and running with Linkerd really fast, but you may hit a wall where it's like, but I want this advanced feature. And at that point, then you have to go pull in a third party package. So for example, in Istio, we saw the uh, routing between AB traffic, and that's just in the box. I can create a virtual service, and I can route traffic across two things. With Linkerd, I need to pull in a third-party package that will monitor those Istio, or the Prometheus syncs, and be able to make uh, intelligent decisions there, controlling the network service. I needed to pull in that third-party package. So ultimately, would you rather the Erector set or would you rather the uh, Shiny box? Ultimately, you and your organization are going to make the choice that is exactly perfect for you there. And I completely agree. That is the proper service mesh for you. And I think this also kind of answers a little bit of the next question, uh, which I wasn't planning to take, but it seems like this person really needs the guidance. They are trying to do the transition from EC2 to Kubernetes and interested in features like service tracing and A-B testing. Both service meshes look interesting, but due to complexity, which one would you recommend to start? And also if we need to, you know, what kind of consideration if we decide to change from one another? And, you know, these are the types of scenarios where you really want to sit with an expert. Uh, I know we have tons of the experts at Wallarm and you can reach out to them requests at wallarm.com but I would encourage you to separately reach out to us directly or somebody in the Linkerd and the, the you know SEO community and just really truly engage um, even if it's like you know potentially under an NDA with a commercial entity to sit down and truly understand what exactly is your use case um, because it, we really you know after this it gets down to those nitty gritties of what exactly you know are you a fintech are you a SaaS like what are you trying to achieve um, how much heavy lifting do we need and you know how flexible do you want to be all of those things have to be considered before these type of decisions are made so with that and thank you into your scenario just a smidge. Yep. Knowing that you're really trying to optimize to avoid complexity, you may not actually need a service mesh yet. You may just be at the spot where the services operating in your cluster are sufficient and uh, the additional computational cost isn't worth it. Yeah. 
That that's very possible. And that's definitely why consult an expert like my good friend Kavya <laughs> and uh, figure out the things that you need to do there. Totally. We're always here to help out the community and please feel free to reach out to us anytime. And thank you, Rob. This was awesome. As anticipated. I loved it. And thank you everyone for attending this session. We look forward to continuing our journey together via CNCF. Most definitely. Thank you, everyone.